The problem that I give to my calculus students every time I teach calculus, we spend a lot of time doing it with hefty techniques. My students at the end of the exercise are, oh, I hope Zvezda doesn't give this on an exam. And then I ask them, would you like to see a three to five line solution that a smart fifth grader would understand? And of course they all want to see it. So let's see how it goes. There is a river and it's a hot October day in California about 200 years ago. There is a poor cow. She has broken its leg and cannot move. And the cow is very thirsty. The cow is six kilometers from the river. All right, so I'm gonna call this point B. A farmer, four kilometers from B down the river, so maybe somewhere here, call this A. The farmer himself is two kilometers away from the river. The farmer has a bucket. So what does the farmer need to do? To walk to the river somewhere, dip the bucket into the water, and then walk to the cow. So walking to the river and then walking to the cow. But it's very hot and these are very long distances, right? Remember, AB by itself is already four kilometers and so on. And the farmer has many, many choices. So which point on the river should he aim for to have his walk as short as possible? So which is this point X here? Oh, yeah, to minimize the walk. Right, right. This feels like it should be simple. Simple, that's right. It, it looks super simple and so my uh, calculus students get to work. They need a variable. So how can I think about this point X? Well, I guess if I know how far it is from point A, I'm just going to denote this by little x, I will locate it. But if this is x, then the remainder to B will be 4 minus x. And immediately you're thinking of the Pythagorean theorem. There you go, right? And so what is the distance that the farmer will make? Fx plus xc, right? So you want to make those two hypotenuse as short as possible. Well, together added up, not individually. So we have these two right triangles. Everyone is happy. The first hypotenuse will be square root of 2 squared plus x squared plus this hypotenuse xc will be 6 squared plus, what was that, 4 minus x squared. And what do we want? We want to minimize this. So minimum for which x? So which x is going to make this mess minimum? Okay. Before I start, I'm going to make some obvious observations, which actually would need proof, but I want to simplify this already horrendous calculus solution. I mean, Brady, would the farmer go somewhere here? Do you think that would be the shortest? Of course not. Of, I mean, just ridiculous, right? Or somewhere here? Nah. No. He probably would have to go between A and B. And I will leave it to the reader to verify why this should happen. So that means that x by itself ranges between 0 to 4. Can't be negative, can't be more than 4. So I'm going to write this here just to help the calculus solution. All right, so how, how, what do we do with calculus? We say that this is a function f of x and uh, we are going to take its derivative. If you don't know calculus, just close your ears, relax, drink coffee and join us in two minutes. Uh, the That's me, Zavesta, so I'll see you later. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, I'll stay. All right, so square root derivative, you're going to have a fraction, two of the same square root underneath, and on top I have to take the inside derivative, which is 2x. All right, we are done with half of that derivative, and we do something similar for the other square root 
we develop a fraction to the same square root in the denominator. And then I have to take the inside derivative, which is a bit more complicated. It's 2, 4 minus x, and then there is a negative in front. Okay, and then we will humanely get rid of those twos here. And if you continue in the standard calculus way, you're going to get in trouble. It's just not easy to solve this. But I am going to proceed in a interesting way. I'm going to say when is this derivative non-negative. I'm going to push things out of here. So that will be x over this radical plus, actually there is no plus anymore. This minus goes to the other side with a plus. The other fraction is here. Okay. Now we would like to get rid of those radicals, but inequalities are very tricky. So they really want things to be positive. But we made them positive because that x was between 0 and 4, which means that both those numerators are positive, denominators are positive. We can square both sides, no problem. So I'm going to square x squared over 2 squared plus x squared. When is that greater than 4 minus x squared, 6 squared plus 4 minus x squared? As you notice, I'm actually not multiplying things out because I've done this a hundred times and I know how to simplify. So keep it compact for now. And then since everything is positive, I'm going to cross multiply 6 squared x squared plus 4 minus x squared x squared, all right, so we're done this way, and now crossing the other way, 2 squared, 4 minus x squared, plus x squared, 4 minus x squared. Now, the key step, why do they keep everything so compact? Because it looks to me, I can simplify, can I? How about I can just get rid of those two? They're the same. Miracle occurs. Now, mm, this 4 and this 36 would give you a 9. All right, so the only survivors here are 9x squared and 4 minus x squared. And again, no need to multiply through because I can just take square root on both sides. And all of those little terms are still positive. So what this turns out to be is 3x on the left, 4 minus x on the right. All right, what is this happening? Move the x to the other side. 4x greater than or equal to 4, x greater than or equal to 1. You know, the calculations didn't seem too complicated, but it's because I made drastic shortcuts. If you don't know about them, this could be a nightmare to solve, especially on an exam. At any rate, what did we show? We showed from a calculus viewpoint that the derivative is greater than or equal to 0 exactly or if and only if x is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, what does this mean for a function? We've practically solved the problem, but uh, let me review. If uh, in fact this is the x-axis, right, and our interval is from 0 to 4, I know that at 1, from 1 on, the function, my function, will increase the original function, not the derivative. That's exactly what this relationship means. So, so the function has to increase like that. So the distance for the farmer, if he goes beyond that point 1, will actually be increasing the total distance. But I said that this condition here is if and only if. So the sign switch if we go the other way around, and the function will be decreasing before 1. So the function is decreasing before 1 and increasing after 1. Well, when is it minimal? 1. At 1, which means that the farmer should go up to this point here, which is 1 kilometer, dip the bucket, and then go to the cow. And you can even calculate what you're going to get. Now. This is complicated if you don't know these shortcuts. Or if you don't know calculus, it's just impossible to understand what I was doing. And if I change the numbers, 2, 4, and 6 to something else, you definitely don't want to redo this whole computation. You really need to know why 1 is 1, strictly speaking. Why should 1 be the perfect number here in a more general way? Okay. And now comes our smart fifth grader with another sheet of paper. 
Oh, yep, Mister. Our cow is dying. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Hold on. The smart field grader is gonna do it. Back to square one, zero, square, minus one. Square one. Square one, okay. So, why is this problem hard? Suppose you don't know calculus, and Brady says he does not know calculus. So what will Brady do? The problem is hard, but for a very specific reason. Can we simplify it? Can we create a problem that looks almost identical to this and it's actually trivial to solve? So what makes the problem hard is that the farmer and the cow are on the same side of the river. What would happen if just for a moment I told you there is our river, our cow, and our farm. Same numbers, right? Ah, oh, I already see it. I mean, what are you going to do? You'll just take the straight yeah. segment towards the cow. Yeah. Hmm. So, can we make our problem look like this simpler one? Which operation will flip the farmer across the river? It's a reflection. So, we're going to reflect the real farmer to a phantom farmer across the river. Okay, so this is going to be F prime, still two kilometers from the river. And now Brayer is thinking, hold on, doesn't the river have width? What happened to the width of the river? Well, who cares about it? Our original problem is not affected by how wide the river is, correct? Not at all. And our world that we're flipping across the river is just in our imagination or on this paper. So we are the bosses. I'm going to forget that the river has any width. Okay, and so now we know very well what the phantom farmer must do. The phantom farmer must go directly to the cow, and this point will be our desired point X. Okay, what should the real farmer do? What do you think? Should the real farmer go to that X? Would that be the shortest path? It feels like it would be, yeah. Yeah, it feels like it should be. And we claim that indeed the farmer has to follow suit and go to exactly the same point to which the phantom farmer would have gone. Okay, how do you actually prove this? Okay, our fifth grader would immediately believe it. But we have some doubts, right? Like, how would you prove it? It's very simple. Any path that the real farmer takes <clears throat> is mimicked by the phantom farmer. So the whole set of paths for the real farmer are exactly the same in length as the phantom farmer. For instance, let's say the real farmer goes somewhere here to point Y, right? And then to cow C. Well, is this the minimum path? We will say no, because the phantom farmer can mimic this, go to Y and go to C, and we see a triangle. F prime, Y, C. And there is a triangle inequality, right? So the triangle inequality would say that the two, in this case, drawn in black sides, F prime, Y plus Y, C, is greater, the sum is greater than the red side, which is F prime C. So this is not going to be the minimal path because we already know that for the phantom farmer, the red path is the minimal and the real farmer has an identical path in length to that one. So we conclude that whatever the phantom farmer is doing in length, the real farmer will mimic it or the other way around. And so the minimal path for the phantom farmer will be the minimal path for the real farmer. And the only thing left here is to find what this point x is without calculus. We already know that the number 1 should appear for ax, but we need now to prove it. Okay. And I need another picture. Not long now, cow. Not long. <laughs> Not long. <laughs> we are almost there. All right, so where is this point x? There are a number of triangles. Brady, how many triangles do you see? Uh... One, two, three, four. Four, but one of them is not so interesting. This, this one here, no, but we just put dots. This and this. There are uh, three right angle triangles. Yeah, yeah, and this one. And so they're not just right angle triangles. 
they are relatives. Those two are twins. Those are congruent. And the third one is similar to them. All right, let me write this down. Triangle FAX is congruent to triangle F prime AX. And those are similar to triangle CBX. That the smaller ones are congruent, I mean, it's obvious they are reflections of each other. Uh, why are they similar to the other one? They have one angle, the same, the right angle, but these two angles are also the same, they are vertical. When two lines intersect in a point, the opposite angles are always equal to each other. Okay, and by the way, this angle here is also equal to them as a reflection of the bottom one. So now we have three similar triangles. Similar triangles are probably the most ubiquitous tool used in solving geometry problems. They appear everywhere. Now, let us take the ratios of sides from the top two triangles. And I'm going to use only the legs of those two right triangles. So I have 2 to x, so fa over ax, which is 2 to x, must be equal. On the other side, cb over bx is the same ratio, but in our notation, cb is 6, and bx was the leftover 4 minus x. I think we're almost done, because 2 and 6 cancel, flip-flop, 4 minus x is 3x. I believe we saw this within the calculus solution. 4 is equal to 4x. x is equal to 1. So indeed, the farmer should walk 1 kilometer down the river from A, dip his bucket in the water, and go to C. Much easier. Much easier. But it also reveal some geometry that is related to um, stuff that we experience every day. For instance, what happens if you have a smooth surface, very smooth like the river, and sunlight is coming to the river at a certain angle? Ready? Any uh, memories from high school physics? Yeah, it, it bounces so that the angle will be the same on the other side. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so that's the sun here. Is this a law? Is this a theorem? What is it? I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's just it, property it, of nature. Yeah, property of nature, a law of nature, right? Well, what the farmer is doing to reach to the cow is exactly the same thing. If I change the numbers 2, 4, 6 to any other numbers, this property of equal angles will be preserved because we will exactly repeat the same solution. Well, with different numbers, but the angles will be equal. So the farmer is doing exactly the same thing as the light is doing when reflecting. But we showed something for the farmer. What did we show? That the farmer is following the shortest possible path. So what is light doing when reflecting? Therefore, Every time light reflects from a surface, the light is following the shortest path. Now, that's amazing. So now, which one is an axiom, a law of nature? Is it the law of reflection or is it that the light is always following the shortest possible path? It's, it's mind-boggling, but the idea that mathematicians have is they will assume that one is an axiom and will prove the other one from it. And in this case, it looks like they're actually equivalent. Let me ask you a human question. If, if a farmer was standing there, a real farmer, and the cow was there, the same problem, but he's got no mathematics, he's got... Do you think he would aim for that point? Do you think his instinct would be to aim for that one kilometre point, or he'd get it wrong? I don't even think he would have the measurements in front of him or her. No, but if they were just walking, they would just yeah. say, I've got to... And I could see it. I can see the river, I can see the cow, I've got to do this thing. Do you think your instincts would, fall, would, would take you to the right place? I don't know about the farmer, but there is another calculus problem, which is about the dog uh, on the beach and a frisbee is thrown into the water. And so the dog has 
choices. How far to run on the beach and then how far to swim. And the dog wants to get to the frisbee as fast as possible. But swimming is slower than running. Exactly, but maybe if he's too far from the water, so it's, it's unclear. And uh, we can, you know, test this on a dog and see what happens. But there is a familiar calculus problem on that. And let me and let me ask you one more question. You sh you showed me two ways to do it: the calculus way and then the the geometry one, which was so much more simple and it seemed elegant to me. Does the calculus method have any advantage over the geometry? Like like if I is there a, is there is one way better than the other for any reason? Well, they are better than each other for different reasons. <laughs> So for this particular type of problem, the geometrical solution definitely wins in terms of elegance. But if I make the problem more complicated, I may not be able to find the geometric solution and then the calculus solution will kick in. What, but, what do you mean by complicated? Do you mean no longer using, you don't mean no longer using integers because surely the numbers don't really matter. How could you make it more Well, maybe they would, the river would not be straight that's one thing. Maybe uh, the farmer has to get water, but also has to get food for the cow from somewhere else. So you can add more variation, more variables. And the bucket's heavier when it's full yeah, of water. Yeah, that's right. And you know, the whole thing becomes an optimization problem and that's what economists are there for, right? Uh, <laughs> but um, I do want to give you another problem to try at home. Of course you do. <laughs> there is a calculus solution and then there is a super sweet geometry solution and it's a, it's a folklore problem. Well, we've been going for a little while, so the next problem we'll do in a separate video. Links to that can be found on the screen, video description, all the usual places. And while you're in the video description, make sure you check out links to our other videos with Zvezda and a podcast we recorded with her where she basically tells her life story. It's really interesting.